Well, good sunny Saturday morning, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, along with this other guy here, Dave Riccio. And uh, every single Saturday, we are here to help you with your car. Have a little bit of fun talking about cars, answer some questions for you. Maybe every repair you're not sure about. Maybe you're shopping for a for a new car and want some advice. We can we can give you our opinion. We can tell you what car not to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Based on what, Dave? Mechanical? Uh, no, those cars that make those bold statements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe in a good or a bad way. But but again, every Saturday we're here to help you. If you want to get involved in the show, ask us a question, have a comment, 602-277-5827, 602 602- Two seven seven K T A R. And now, for those of you that are a little bit shy and maybe don't want to call in, you can text. We'll interact with you via text messaging at four one one nine two three. Again, the text is four one one nine two three. And today on the bumper to bumper roadmap, we've got Factor Fiction. Got a good one coming up a little bit later. Open phones and uh, open smartphones, I guess, for texting. And uh, are you driving a cringe-worthy car? Now, <laughs> there, there, there's a list. There, there's, you know, there's a list for everything, I guess. And this list came out, and and uh, you may be driving one, but I guess that's subjective, Dave. Uh, well, there's, I mean, we <laughs> cringe at cars that we don't like to work on, or we just think are just bad cars to buy. Like someone will have a, a Saab, and I'm sorry if you're a Saab <laughs> owner, but I, I cringe, I wince. But these are more the cars where you're trying to make bold statements. So I ran across this article about Cringe Car, the top 10 most embarrassing cars that you can drive. I'm not going to mention that mine was on it. Okay, I just did. (laughs) But number one, the smart car. You know, my kids say, that's not smart. They know it's not smart. And a smart car, I did a transmission on a smart car once, and I got in it with my service manager, and I get behind the wheel, and it's really, everything's strange, and nothing is sized right. And I went to grab the emergency brake, and I did grab my service manager's inner thigh, and it was awkward. You got a handful of lap. (laughs) (laughs) He never looks at me the same ever since then. Right. So, number one, smart car. I mean, come on. But what makes you cringe about it? I, the the problem with this list from the insurance carinsurance dot com or, or whatever it was, I, well they say the most embarrassing cars to drive, and I guess maybe you'd have owned a car that was embarrassing because it was this Toyota Corolla that was falling apart with rust, and the carpet was hanging out the bottom floorboard, and it had a purple door, and uh, you know a green fender, and the rest of it was primer. That might be embarrassing to it's drive. It's the bold statements. You don't drive this Chevrolet Malibu. I mean, that's a vanilla car. No one gets excited about a Malibu. It's totally neutral when I see it. I'm not saying anything. I see a smart car, and I go, hmm. You know, and I'm not really wincing in a smart car other than I'm just thinking smart car and one of the other cars on the list is a Hummer H2. Those two get in an accident, it's not going to be good. Well, but the, see, I think I cringe at a smart car because I cringe if I could imagine sitting in that thing and getting blasted by my excursion. Mm, not, not good. So that's what makes me cringe. Is a car a little foofy <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe but but there's a comment on the you know some of the people's comments that they can write on this article and they said hey uh you know smart car is typically not someone overcompensating that can't afford uh the car they're, compensating they're... <laughs> you have to explain compensating to me <laughs> i'm gonna leave that one up to you <laughs> uh but but they're, they're not overcompensating it's typically maybe a higher net worth person driving that smart car because they want to it's not the bmw owner that you know, we call the thirty thousand dollar millionaire that thirty thousand air. <laughs> yeah, that can't afford the Beamer, but they want to drive one because that's the cool thing to do. Uh, so that's why I would look at the smart car as a cringe car. The people that bought it didn't didn't buy it because it's cringe worthy. Well, next on the list, the the Nissan Cube. That's number two, and uh, the Nissan Cube speaks for itself. I mean, it, it looks like it's still. You know, they brought it out of the box it was shipped in, and it's the same shape as the box. I mean, it literally is a toaster on wheels. You know, you own one of those. Uh, yeah, we have one at Virginia Auto Service. That is uh, Tim, the manager's uh, shop car, but I tell you, he loves it. And when I bought that that thing, you should have seen the guy that got out of it. They brought it down from the dealer for us to look at, 
and and this guy steps out of the car, and I thought, when is he going to stop getting out? He's like seven <laughs> foot two, <laughs> and Tim's tall too. He fits in there nice. He likes it. But they it's do a- have a, they have a lot of headroom. I think they give me you know because I drive a Honda Element, which I believe is the original boxy looking uh, number ten on the chart, Dave. Yes, number way. ten on the chart, but uh, <laughs> it, it would probably get like six more steps up and get into the top five. If they knew the bike rack was <laughs> in the bike rack on top, right? So the Honda Element, but uh, number three, the Hummer H2, and this one is kind of like you know I don't want to drive an H1 because that's totally not practical, you know. But I do need to compensate, so I'm a practical compensator with the Hummer H2. I think right there, Hummer H3. I think you move over to the ladies category. Hummer H3 did not make the list. If you're a guy driving an H3, I think that's kind of a chick car. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We might offend somebody today, Dave. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But I guess that if you have the Pontiac Aztec, you're on the oh, list. Oh, and... Aztec. I don't know what, what happened to that car. Was that good for one year, two years? How long was that on the market? Uh, little, isn't that the one that they made the camper you could camp with? Yeah, the, they were the really car, but... trying way too hard with that deal. I think it was a, it was uh, featured in one of the TV shows, Dark Angel or something. The, the, the main guy drove one of those. They, they could never do anything with that car. Maybe yeah. that's what put the final nail in the coffin for Pontiac. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody saw it on the movie or on the show, and I don't want that. I was this, a little worried we are going to offend somebody with this topic, but, uh, you know, I don't think we have too many Aztec owners out there, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, whatever. Uh, PT Cruiser's on the list with the SSR. Uh, you know, I think those things were kind of cool when they came out, but now... Um, PT Cruiser with the SSR. SSR what? Chevrolet? The Chevy SSR. That's the truck-looking thing, but maybe it's supposed to look like a 40s kind of older car. I don't know what the... I don't know. What what kind of personality drive... You know, when you drive that car, does that move you over into the narcissistic? I mean, does that mean you're borderline narcissistic, or am I just... just not, you're not I don't your even head, know what like. you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but it's an economical car. Another one I hear, the Subaru Baja. They said it tries too hard. That was the most cited reason in the surveys. It tried too too hard as the designer. What does it say here? Funny looking. But, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I my parents' friend had a Subaru Brat, and I thought it was the coolest thing because it had these seats in the back with some handles you could hang on to. I mean, I was only seven when I thought that. That car was a that. vehicular travesty. I mean, come on. Really? Trying way too hard with that thing. Nissan Murano Cabriolet. I've never even seen one of those. Mm, Where's that? What number is That's that? That's number 12. Um, My list yeah. only goes up to 10. Who's embarrassed? Let's see. Um, Honda Element. 16% of women were embarrassed. Good thing you're married, Dave. You're not scoring any points. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I, you know, some people compensate, but in order to drive an Element, you really have to be secure in who you are. You know, and, and it is. I handed in my man badge the day I bought that car. Slid it right across the counter to the sales guy. Said, here, take it. I'll take the car. <laughs> I love the car. These are all cars you either love or hate. There's no in between. There's no warm. It's love it or hate it. What about color? Uh, the most cr- the color that makes you cringe uh, depends on the car is, uh, was 38%, but uh, the overwhelming majority of the of the uh color cringe is purple and when i see purple all i can think of is that dodge caravan what other mm. pur- what other purple car was there you know my wife and i used to make f- you know make fun of the minivan you know the minivan is like we're never going to drive one of those Did we rented one, one of those to drive to san diego and we're like this thing is so practical <laughs> that's when you know life has changed in the 20s minivan is not cool by the 30s you've you, you've slid your man badge in and you're like i could drive a minivan Totally practical. But they, well, it was Honda that really made it cool. You know, the Honda commercials with all the, you know, whatever, the 70s music playing. I don't know. I don't remember them all that all that well. But Station Wagon, my wife thinks we were talking about last night. She thinks she's a grandma driving her, her, her Station Wagon. I say, but babe, it's a sport wagon. It's actually a cool car. She thinks it's maybe for her. Will the station not. wagon ever come back? I mean, that was a that was a fine piece of machinery. You know, if you remember the uh, National Lampoons, the station wagon. He was so proud of that thing. Well, I think the days of the wood panels and the National Lampoons and and all that uh, those station wagons are long gone. But the the little uh, import wagons, uh, pretty cool, I think. Well, we hope you are truly not offended. We're just have, trying to have a little fun here. If you're driving the embarrassing car. Please text us in the most embarrassing car you've ever driven or tre- text your car questions, 411 If you've got anything you want to talk about your car, 
602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are talking about cringe cars today. Do you drive a cringe car? Are you embarrassed to drive your car? I don't know. I mean, your car is a statement about who you are. So you may be driving a hand-me-down. You really had no choice in the matter. And unfortunately, that's what it is, A to B. But if you went out and picked one of these cars that is making a bold statement, you're leaving yourself up for criticism. (laughs) That's why I drive a Honda Element, because I'm very secure with who I am. So I got a couple of texts. One says, Plymouth Neon, enough said. I think I would agree with that. Plymouth Neon, Dodge Neon, all same. 1979 Nissan Datsun hatchback wagon. That is a that's a cool car. That was a cool car in its day. <laughs> the AMC Matador. See, that was before my time, so I don't know what that was. AMC. Ma- I know what the Gremlin was, right? I think that AMC was some kind of Jeep sedan, four wheel drive, station wagon ish looking thing. You know. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, AMC, you know, AMC stood for all mistakes combined because you would work on one. Literally, you'd have a Ford starter, you'd have <laughs> GM uh, emissions pieces inside the air cleaner. Well, it was Jeep, just everybody else's parts. <laughs> just everybody else's parts. <laughs> it was just a, con- you know, every- yeah, the turn signal <laughs> switch was from a General Motors, like you said. That's not what it stood uh, for when I was in high school, but uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you can't really say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so 602-277-5827 if you want to call in with a car question, car problem, anything we can help you with on your car, just give us a call. Easy to do. Don't be shy. And uh, cringeworthy car question, technical help, whatever we can help you with today, we're at your service. For sure. Well, up first this segment, we've got Jack in Sun City on a 2001 Toyota Highlander. Go ahead, Jack. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. I don't. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I have 80,000 miles on my vehicle, and I'm wondering when I should change the transmission fluid, and if I do change it, should I also change the transmission filter? Dave, I think that's right. Absolutely. Most common question. And a lot of the manufacturers are very light on the recommendations for transmission service. And I think that's a mistake because we do so many valve body repairs. And that's just that's just transmission fluid that's got a lot of dissolved solids in it and just wears out the valve bodies. So I would definitely say change it, and I would definitely say change the filter. So one of the things we like to do at Tri-City Transmission, we do the service. We road test it, make sure it works good. Then we go ahead and remove the transmission pan, take the old filter, dissect it to see what kind of health the transmission has. Go ahead and install a new filter, new fluid, and that's the best thing to do. So that would be step one. A complete fluid exchange would be if the fluid was really uh, oxidized and varnished and and, it really needed more more attention. Now, I don't think that that doesn't have the new world standard fluid in it, Dave, which they say would go 100,000 miles. Is that is that a Dexron 3 or that, that's got the I mean, Toyota? T4. T4 is a fluid that's in there. Now, so you, what do you think the recommendation is on that from OE, or when would you do it? Every 30, every 50? I would say every every couple of years, every 30, you know, 30,000 miles. So, I mean, I would say at the, at the long side of things, I think you should service the transmission every 50,000 miles. But again, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to get away from a transmission repair for the life of the car. That's what you're trying to avoid is not having to do that. Whether it be a valve body or, or would, whatever maybe. Would you say the same thing? Let's say that's a 2011 Highlander. Like I've got my 2010 Tundra. I serviced my transmission, even though they say 100,000 miles. I just did the drain and refill at 30. And yeah, that would be sufficient pan. at 30, you know, but uh, maybe do it again at, you know, 60. You do pull the pan and you do take a look at the filter. You want to know how the transmission's doing, if you've got anything, any, any room for concerns, and really finding out what's in the pan is key. A lot of people are saying, ah, we can just flush it out. It cleans out the filter. That's not true, <laughs> okay? The debris that ends up in the filter, what that does is, as it gets plugged up, it can start to restrict the tr- you know the flow to the pump. Mm-hmm. So I'm a big proponent of at least getting that filter change every other time. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I like a flush and then a service, a flush and a service. And then if you're towing, of course, you want to shrink that interval too. Or a lot of around, time, around town driving. Every time it shifts, there's friction and it right. on the fluid. So. For sure. So thanks for the call, Jack. We're going to go with uh, looks like Marlene in Phoenix on a 1997 Ford Ranger. Go ahead, Marlene. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Mary Ann. Mary Ann, okay. Uh, yeah, I have a 97 Ford Ranger with 250,000 miles, and I really would like to drive it off a cliff. 
Mm-hmm. I'm, it really starts up and runs great, but I'm having all kinds of suspension issues. You know, there's no back seat, you know, and so I'm always fighting clutter. Stuff falls down behind the seat. And now I've got electrical problems going on. My dome light doesn't work, and it's making this ding, ding, ding noise behind the dashboard, which I think might have been connected to the lighting system somehow because now it's not even making that noise. And my windshield wipers are going on and off intermittently while I'm driving, and I'm not even turning them on. You know, are so, you are you at the point where you want to stay in the car when you drive it off the cliff, or are you just ready to get rid of the I don't, You know, some days, yeah, because I'm usually behind the wheel. <laughs> when I just, like, actually, when I heard this radio show, I was so frustrated with my truck. I just get so angry with, you know, the issues with it. And who, who designs these seats where you put anything on the seat that falls by? I'm always finding all my treasures behind the you know, looking for all my stuff. How, how many more? Out. How many more years do you want to drive this car? Like, like none. Like none. Like I mean, you're ready. You're ready to move on. Yeah, I need a new car so bad. I, I, I hate it. You know. <laughs> well, it sounds like you got a lot of life out of it, but. I, oops. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you got a lot of life out of it, which is good, but. Um, if you want to start tackling those problems, the windshield wiper coming on all the time, the lights ding are the deal. Maybe you wore the dinger out <laughs> from right. from going off so much. But we're gonna in my shop, we would be looking at some common thing. What's the common denominator? Why are the windshield wipers gonna come on? Uh, what? Why might the the lights flash and the door jam or the door dome might be working intermittently like that? It doesn't seem like the wipers would be connected. I'd first start thinking of the the master switch or what we call the combo switch in the steering column area there. Uh, for the wipers, but it doesn't seem like the two are related that much with the lights and the wipers. When cars get up in age and they get a lot of miles on them, 200,000, 250,000, you know, you start to get a lot of electrical problems, don't you? I mean, that seems to be more the issue. Well, yeah, I mean, you get electrical problems, but, you know, I'll tell you, Dave, it's kind of off topic a little bit. With the average life of the car, I think the average average age of the fleet on the road in the U.S. now is tip 12 years. And in, in our shop, we see more and more cars with high mileage. And I'll tell you one thing. They are becoming more and more difficult to fix because you see these problems. I mean, yeah, you have an ignition control module go out. You have a sensor that goes out. And typically, you just replace those, program the system, do whatever, and, and everything is fine. Maybe you have a couple other repairs. But we're starting to see these cars with these high mileage, 160, 170, 210. And they're not ordinary repairs. I mean, you have wiring harness issues. You've got just strange things happening and uh i mean we've really got our butts kicked lately part of it i'm venting but you have these strange repairs and they're out of the ordinary well i think when you know these cars when you buy these cars and you're thinking about maintenance people end up owning them longer than they thought they were so if you neglect the car neglect the car neglect the car neglect the car skip on all the services it's going to catch up with you at some point so we know we're going to have to sell the car at some point, and we know we're going to have to, uh, you know, if we end up keeping it at 200,000 miles, we don't want big repair bills. So we're talking about this transmission maintenance, do I service it, don't I service it. If you're going to own that car 10 years from now, heck yeah, let's service it. Let's keep it because we want to avoid buying a transmission for the life of this car. So well, I had a couple different ones come in. Worst car, 1977, husband traded in my cool MG midget. Chevy Vega, that was another good one. Ford Pinto, personalized plate, ba-boom. Well, yeah, if you, want a, <laughs> if you want a little bit of barbecue action. Uh, this guy loved his 1972 orange Opal mm, AMC Pacer. Was that the one from, uh, what, was that? what was that movie? Wayne's World? That was a Pacer, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. A little, uh, you know, and then there's some new ones. Here's a guy wanting to know about a 2000, or 1996 Corvette. I guess that's not really, I wouldn't really cringe too much in that car. I'm not a big fan of Corvettes, but uh, maybe the, it's the newer a good, ones. It's a good weekend warrior. It's a good time. But, you know, the thing I noticed about the Corvette after a few days, I'm tired of bending over to get in that thing. So yeah, Or trying to get out. When we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. You know, speaking of Hot Rod Lincoln's Dave, I think uh, Lincoln Town Car was 
number seven on the list of cringeworthy cars that we were talking about earlier. And uh, I guess, you know, maybe you got a suicide door, old uh, old school Lincoln, probably pretty cool. I wouldn't be cringing in, in that. I'd be cringing if I was uh, behind someone, somebody that was overcompensating with some mm. oversized tires. Throwing up some rocks or something. Oversized like tires or oversized spoilers. You know, when you got that big spoiler, that's a, that's a sheer compensation science. What about the the knee, <laughs> the turbo neon with the big spoiler on the back that fastened me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, to be boy. honest with you, I, I had oversized tires at one point. You know, it's funny. We're, I, I don't know when we come back to the show. Am I supposed to say good morning? It's not quite afternoon, but it certainly isn't morning. Uh, what is it? I, at work, I'm all, at, all the time, Mike. Uh, Virginia Happy Auto, good day. Well, I'm like Virginia Auto Service. Uh, good. And I have to look down at the <laughs> clock. Afternoon, morning. So, well, up for this segment, we're going to go with Robert in Phoenix on a 2001 Ford Mustang GT with no oversized spoiler. I sure hope so, Robert. How you doing? No stock spoiler, guys. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? So uh, this is my wife's car, actually, the uh, Mustang, and it's actually we bought it. We got it about ten months ago. And in the past uh, month or so, the gas mileage has really gone down on it. When we when we first got the car, I changed all the fluids and filters, um, spark plugs, and the uh, car was running great. And just recently, it just, I don't know why, but we're getting about 10 miles per gallon out of it. Uh, I just, I'm not sure what else, what to look for or what, what now, else it could be. Did you do that work yourself or did you have that done? I did it myself. Okay. Um, now, when you say you're getting less mileage, is that because of a calculator, an automated deal on the dash, or are you actually checking actual fuel mileage? No, we hand calculate it, uh, okay. you know, pump it and check how many miles we drove from last time and uh, how many gallons we pumped. So. Did, did you uh, happen to change out for performance air filter or anything like that in the car? Nope, it's all uh, stock. The only thing that is, uh, is different than how it came from the factory is uh, we had a uh, leak in the uh, heater box, and so I just bypassed it. Mm-hmm. What was the gas mileage when you got the car? We were averaging about 15 and a half. Okay. Wow. Well, either maybe your wife is just hot rodding the heck out of that thing and not telling you about it, so maybe you want to look at the tire wear <laughs> before you start digging into it. But, you know, off the top of my head, my, my first thing I'm thinking I'd be looking – that's why I asked you about the air filter, a contaminated mass airflow sensor. Certainly changed gas mileage. But that usually makes the car run a little leaner, not richer. Uh, lean is less fuel. So I think you might get better gas mileage, but then again, it might make it inefficient. So if uh, you sound very mechanically inclined, if you did change those parts and do those services, maybe try cleaning the mass airflow sensor. You could go to the uh, fuel pressure regulator. That's going to be on the fuel rail, on typically on one end of it on that car. And you could maybe pull off the vacuum line to see if that's not uh, broken. I mean, if the diaphragm's not broken and sucking some uh, some raw fuel into the engine. I would think that that car would pick that up, though, and turn on a, a check engine light. You would think so. Yeah. You know, fuel bleeding down overnight in the cylinder or something like that. I mean, that's a pretty big drop. That's Five 30%, miles. man. Yeah, that's big. So. Check Something going on there. Check with the mass airflow sensor. I'm assuming there's no check engine light or service codes. And, and other than that, somebody's just going to need to get in there and do what they call mode six diagnosis and go in and look at really the background of what's happening on the uh, in the computer. Well, we had a text. The lady took her car into a shop, and uh, they replaced a spark plug. Car runs great now. But there's 5,000 extra miles on the odometer. Do you think they're running drugs in her car? Well, they, you know, what, what do you think is going on? She says, "Why would that happen?" Man, five thousand—that that's big. I had a years ago, years ago. I'm talking nine, you know, over ninety-seven. It might have even been earlier than that. We had a Mazda in the shop, and I and I'm pretty sure. Gosh, I don't remember if it had a digital dash or not on the odometer, but I remember plugging in or doing something with the battery. And all of a sudden, that car is racking the miles. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just the odometer is just no speedometer. I tell you, that thing was cranking on the mileage. And the people had an extended warranty. And we, I mean, we had to write a letter. It put on like 7, 10. I mean, it was a lot. It was thousands of miles. It, and, and I don't remember how that thing finally got resolved. But 
weird things happen. I don't know what kind of car that is, but yeah, it's something certainly... something electronically glitched. I'm pretty sure they didn't drive it 5,000 miles. But have you ever been accused, Dave? Oh, you guys mm, drive oh, my yeah. car. I know you had one recently <laughs> about they complained about all the gas you use. It's we like... had an intermittent issue, and we drove this car. We drove it hard because that's that's how we make them act up. And and uh, she was a little disappointed when her you know eighth of a tank was gone. You know what did you do with my car? Well, we had to drive it. So uh, yeah. just part of the deal. Yeah. What are you doing driving my car so much? Well, yeah, that intermittent problem. You, you <laughs> tend to have to do We've got to get those to act up. For sure. Well, we're going to go with Ursula in Phoenix on a 2004 Chrysler Sebring. Go ahead, Ursula. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Thank you. Um, I have a 2004 Chrysler Sebring, and I've owned it for maybe a year or so. I bought it used with low miles, and I drive a lot. And I've been doing, like, the maintenance is I've had to replace the alternator. Um, and once I replaced that, my gas control kind of started wigging out. And then now I'm having more problems and more problems. I'm still paying for the car, but I don't know if it would be worth it to fix everything because the shop I go to was quoting me about three grand. Ooh. Or to um, cut my losses at this point. Well, when you say you keep having problems, are you having problems related to the electrical and re- related to that alternator replacement? Or is it just, you know, you have brakes now and you have a leaky radiator later and one thing leads to well, the next? Or Well, and I do expect to replace brakes. I expect to replace, you know, the wearable objects. Sure. But I'm having more electrical, yes. And I would... I, I try to, I'm weird, I try to make myself feel better about driving the car that, you know, <laughs> needs repairs, and I go to the car wash, and sure. they actually damage my car further, so then now the repairs, like, I, I'm just, I'm frustrated with it, because I need shock, uh, they said I have a uh, exhaust leak, mm-hmm. and they want to do all of the services for the fluids, which I'm fine with that, until they show me the price. <laughs> right. Well, I, I guess how many miles are in this car? Uh, one hundred and thirty thousand. Okay. Well, that... I drive a lot. I put um, seventy thousand miles on it in the last year. Oh wow, you are driving. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I guess what I would do, and, and you sound very reasonable when it comes to taking care of your car. And your question, I think that you're most concerned about was, is it worth fixing? And and this is where I think going to a shop that is going to go in, and it sounds like they did, and give you a very thorough examination of the entire car and not just dribble it to you because they're afraid of giving you that list that people that are. That ugly picture. That there's this notion that the shop is trying to sell you something or trying to convert your oil change into this you know magic uh, profit ticket or something like that, which I think is just not the case most of the time. But you just – I I would go back to them – and say, I, I maybe I might be interested in doing these repairs. I'm on the fence. I need some assurance. I, I know you can't tell me if the air conditioner is going to go out next year or or what, you know, some mysterious electrical problem. But fundamentally, is the car okay? Yes, it needs shocks and struts. Does it need them? Or is it would it just make the car ride nicer and make your tires last longer? There's difference between need and want and a breakdown issue. So maybe, again, it's that... Get that inspection, everything, everything, nitpick the whole car like you were buying it. And then you have to sit down and look, if I could sell this car for two grand and I have three, now I go buy a $5,000 car. You go buy a five thousand dollar car. You get you're gonna have it's still gonna need three thousand dollars worth of work. So you got to look at what you're gonna replace it with. And I look at cost per mile. In my mind, cars are good for two hundred thousand miles. You may spend three thousand or five thousand dollars to get that second hundred thousand miles, but that's gonna happen. So do I go? Do I go buy essentially rebuy my car as used for five thousand bucks? Yeah, you might buy your same car. It just has a different color and a different badge. And it's, uh, maybe you're buying, instead of a Sebring, you're buying a Civic or you're buying a Malibu or whatever car you might. But it, you might just trade the same problem for another set of, and I'm not saying problems, but set of circumstances, possibly. Well, you're looking, I mean, you're, you're looking at, you know, do I invest in this car? Do I get to 200, you know, get it to 200,000 miles? So uh, you can math that out. There's a lot of repair calculators, repair or replace to see what makes sense. What cost per mile does it cost you to drive this car? So thanks, Ursula, for the call. We are going to go with, looks like Bonnie in Scottsdale on a 2005 Nissan Pathfinder. Go ahead, Bonnie. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good, good day. 
by yes, the way. Yes, good day. Exactly. There's a good one. Good midday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I have my Pathfinder, uh, like two months after I paid for it, which was two years ago, the en- service engine soon, light came on. I have approximately 37,000 miles on it, which is very little for that year car. Yeah, that's low mileage. And, but what has happened in the past, like this past year, I was traveling a longer um, distance to work, and I was going about 50 miles an hour. And the, the service engine light went off. But the biggest thing is I don't know how many miles I've got left, you know, um, you know, when I'm driving. I've forgotten the name of what that is. Not the odometer, but, you know, the, it just... Tripometer, maybe. Yes, I think that's so, what it is. I so think. Are you, were you thinking that you're relating the service engine soon light to needing to actually get the car serviced, like you had a scheduled maintenance? No, due? actually, okay. I've already, but they, I've had it checked out. They said it has something to do with emissions, but I found that really bizarre that, it, you know, with the low mileage I have on it. Uh, right. Well, you know, that, that, that check engine light can come on for a number of, I mean, there's literally hundreds of reasons the check engine light can come on. With, with a low mileage car like that, the first thing we might be looking at, well, we need to see what the code is first. But for what would typically come to mind is maybe a, a, a loose gas cap or a poorly fitting gas cap. Uh, that's going to reset itself most likely after a couple trips once you catch and get the gas cap tight again. You get these, you know, they are gremlins, little little Furbies, <laughs> things that just happen occasionally. You get some weird kind of deal, maybe a particular set of circumstances, and the light will be on. When that light comes on, it's going to set a diagnostic code in the computer, and that might clear itself out after a couple trip cycles or several trip cycles when the car is doing its continuous self-test. For sure. Well, does Virginia Auto do a gremlin removal service? We, yeah, we uh, have a little <laughs> if you seance. Got a, if you've got uh, a car gremlin and you need a car exorcist, uh, the guys at Virginia Auto have got you covered. So. It's time for Fact or Fiction. All right. I've heard this one. I think it could be urban legend. I'm really not sure. But I knew if I didn't like somebody and I took a little funnel and poured uh, you know, a bag of sugar into their gas tank, it would destroy the car. I've never tried it. At least I wouldn't tell you if I had. <laughs> you were talking about an ex-girlfriend uh, or something. Yeah, ex-girlfriend, yeah. something like that. Fact or fiction, if I pour sugar in a gas tank, is it going to destroy the car? Because I heard it does all kinds of awful things. <laughs> things uh, I would smile about for that ex-girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's. Uh, I guess since we don't have multiple people in here to play the guessing game, I'm just going to tell you it's fiction. And I'll tell you, it wasn't until a few years ago. I didn't, I didn't know any better. I, I've, uh, I've even had some insurance adjusters come in the shop going, "Oh boy, that gas and the sugar, or sugar in the gas tank, <laughs> bad news." <laughs> and uh, it really isn't. I, I thought it would turn to a blob of something, but apparently, sugar does not dissolve in fuel. So it's not going to go into the fuel injection system and, and be like you're trying to push molasses. Yeah, through, it's not going to. It's not going to turn to mucus. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, it may plug up the fuel filter. It could plug up the the sock where the where the fuel pump is picking up uh, um, uh, fuel out of the tank to deliver to the engine and cause a delivery issue there. But it's it's not. Uh, you know, you might have to pull the gas tank out, flip it over. I mean, if you really want to get even with somebody, put some water in there. That's going to sink right to the bottom. Or, That's or, always how I return my rental cars. I top them off with a garden hose right before I take it back because <laughs> I'm not paying five bucks a gallon. Or, so we've got Loretta and Nick. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are your KTR car guys every Saturday from 11 to noon, taking your phone calls, taking your texts, your questions, anything about cars, finding out which car you're embarrassed to drive, we can handle that as well. So we do have a text here. Where would you recommend I get my hub bearing replaced on my 2005 Silverado? Well, first off, if you don't have a relationship with a great shop already, I'm going to say go to bumpertobumperradio.com. And uh, there's shops on Bumper to Bumper Radio all over the valley. 
They're all family owned, small. It's not a big chain. You can always find the guy who can make a decision without it having to go. I'll talk to this guy, talk to that guy, talk to our claims department, talk to this, talk to that. You can find the owner. He's there. He's there on a regular basis. So bumper to bumper radio.com. I love the support of small business so and local business. The money all stays right here in town. And it's not just mechanical shops, but body shops. We've got two great body shops on there. I-17 Collision. Over by me, side. First Class Auto Body, who did my wife's Toyota Camry, which works fantastic. Thanks, Dave. Well, Dave, one of the next texts we have up here, and we're getting a lot of great texts today, but uh, someone wants to know about... Uh, Looking P.S. Looking to buy an Acura MDX. Thoughts? And I, I have a little a bit of opinion about that MDX. I've never owned one. A buddy of mine had one. And, you know, I always like Honda and Acura products. If somebody asks me what kind of car to buy, it's typically the first word in my mouth is Honda. Um, or, of course, Acura, same family. But the MDX, I'm not real fond of. I think the really? car, it has a lot. This particular year, anyway. Now, I don't know if it had some recent model changes, but let's just say a three- or four-year-old MDX my buddy had. And sold terrible blind spots. The dash, I, I couldn't figure it out. The, the the satellite dish, the cruise control, the the radio deal, the XM radio, the climate control. What a disaster! So I I would uh, depending on what you're looking at, you need to spend some time. These cars have owners manuals that are books now. So it's an ergonomical feel. It's not a uh, cringe as the mechanic. People say, hey, I got a sob. Can you guys work on it? That's a guaranteed cringe. But an MDX, is a, I think it's a fantastic car as far as mechanically sound. You can't go wrong with a Honda. You just you just can't. What I'm saying is just the way the car worked and functioned and then the blind spots. To me, it was a disaster. So, Well, we are going to go with Loretta in Phoenix on a 1999 Dodge diesel truck. Go ahead, Loretta. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thank you. Um, there's 192,000 miles on my truck, and it seems I have a steering gear problem. Uh, the steering's been a little loose, but over just the last few days, it's gotten worse. And so I'm just concerned if it's, uh, uh, I don't want to damage anything anymore. But <laughs> When you say loose, you're cruising down the road at 45 miles an hour. If you were to just kind of wiggle the steering wheel back and forth, do you feel like there's an inch of play there before anything happens, or is it two inches, three inches? Um, well, it's been just maybe like two inches, but then uh, like yesterday, it seemed like it was a lo- uh, it was looser. Well, there's there's several things in the front end in, in, that are going to can cause you to uh, have that feeling or have that wear in the front end. Ball well, ball joints. The first thing I'm going to be looking at is the, is the steering gear, the the uh, steering gear box, possibly a tie rod end. Uh, pitman arm, depending on the type of front end. I mean, you you could get a uh, culmination of a lot of little things equal this problem all of a sudden. For it to happen all of a sudden, though, something something must have changed. Do we have something loose, like a loose steering gearbox? You ever seen one of those loosen up from the frame? What? Yeah, rag joint. Well, I've seen the frame break too, where that where that steering right, where box mounts. bolts to the front of the frame. I think some Dodges had problems with the with the thing getting weak, depending on what the truck is being used for and and how it's how it's been used over the last hundred and fifty thousand miles. So again, if you're looking for a shop to take that to, that it's really someone's going to have to get in there. and And the term we would use in the shop is shake down the front end. We're going to jack it up. We're going to use a, to get the wheel off the ground. Check the wheel bearings. We're going to pry up and down on the tires to check the ball joints. Uh, have someone shake the wheel left and right while there's somebody else underneath looking at what's moving and what and what should be moving and what's not moving. And, and you're going to find that shop at bumper to bumper radio.com. In my field, of red is if it changed all of a sudden from two inches to three inches fairly quickly, I would say sooner rather than later. You know, we could have some some bigger issue going on that we want to get taken care of. So we're going to go with Nick in Mesa on a 2000 Chevrolet 1500 pickup. Go ahead, Nick. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Hey, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Hey, I've got a Chevy pickup that's got just turned 100,000 miles, and I have an issue with it. Well, it did it twice. It won't shift in overdrive. There you go, Dave. When you say it won't shift in overdrive, so uh, you leave from a stop and, uh, you know, shifts from first gear to second gear. Maybe that happens at 10, 15 miles an hour. Second gear to third gear, you know, 25 miles an hour. You know, what, what, what speed do you feel at not shifting in overdrive, and how do you know it's not doing that? Well, I didn't notice that. I was up going out on town on the V-Line, and, you know, I'm doing like 65 miles an hour, and it's turned like three grand. I'm like, how come this thing isn't shifting in overdrive? So I took my foot off the gas. It wouldn't shift. 
I shifted the neutral back in the drive. It wouldn't shift. Is there any check engine lights on? No. Okay. Well, I mean, fourth gear in the 4L60, that would be the transmission in there, is controlled by a band. But the other thing that, that the band controls is second gear as well. So it's a 2-4 band. So I'd expect you to lose both. So if something else isn't missing from the equation, it, it seems a little bit unusual. Uh, sometimes we do shift solenoids in there, but usually there's yeah. two gears missing. So you miss a first and a fourth. How does it take off leaving a stop? Well, now I, I've taken it to a, 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 my transmission guy, and he can't find anything wrong with it. And well, he said, just drive it. And he said, if it doesn't shift in the fourth, pull over and see if it won't shift from first and it takes off in second. Well, it's been two weeks, and it runs great. Mm. So we're going we're gonna to have to catch it in the act to see what, really what's going on. So, But uh, you can also follow up at bumper2bumperradio.com on the contact link. I can dig into that more with you if you send me an email there. You know, that that's a funny uh, statement too, Dave, is – and I don't know if there's some confusion with, with uh, communicating with the shop of they couldn't find it, meaning we weren't able to duplicate the problem, so therefore we don't know what to repair, or it, we saw it broken and we can't figure it out. Those are two totally different things, so it may be worth going back to that guy and following up. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Peter, for running the show. Remember to watch out for bicycles. They say a bicyclist is killed every 13 hours. Watch out for them. We will see you next week.